United Way has been very instrumental in the work that we're doing to lift our children in the entire county. With the Child Wellbeing Index, it provides to us, our county, to the state, an excellent measure that allows us to see if we're making progress. When they share with us that our well-being index had improved, clearly we saw this as the appropriate time and a wonderful opportunity to partner with them to host the Clayton County State of the Children. Clayton County's graduation rate in general has gone up in the schools that we're in, we're contributing by working with those students, meeting the needs, developing robust partnerships with the Clayton County school system. We've chosen to approach this work through partnership and collaboration because this work is so complex, it requires more than just the school system. The school system clearly has the responsibility of educating the 55,000 plus children in Clayton County, but we acknowledge that we need families, we need businesses, we need partners, we need our elected officials, we need our parents, we need our community leaders to help us to do this work. I think we're all looking to develop a, a system, a, um, a response, a support network for these kids and these families so that they can become healthy, productive individuals in, in adulthood, that their living situations are, are stabilized, their access to education and support systems is not only sort of known to them, but is out front. The first block is basically providing support to families before the children even get to school. As you well know, if you listen to that building block, that implies that there has to be many, many entities beyond the school system that are supporting families even before the child lands in pre-K or kindergarten. Therefore, it's important for us to work with our government, to work with our various program entities and agencies, the United Ways to ensure that our families are getting the support that they need that will increase the likelihood that our students are successful when they land in our schools. We want to clearly thank the United Way and all of our partners for helping us to improve child well-being here in Clayton County. We have some more improvement that we need to see and that we're working on, but we want to pause and celebrate the improvement that we have seen. We're thankful, we're honored, and we want our community to know that we're doing our best to ensure that all of our children, all of our children are very well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Morcise Beasley and Crystal Black Mills to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Clayton County Public Schools. Today we have the entire village gathered, at least a representation of the village. I'd like to first acknowledge our board members who are here. If our board members that are present, if you would stand, please. Let's give them a hand. I, I wish I could say I see you, but I can't see you. So wave. Thank you. Well, as I welcome you today, as we prepare to hear about the state of the children here in Clayton County, I must share that yesterday evening I had to go to uh, the Southern Regional and stand over a child whose body was lifeless. We had a child, an 11th grader named Amani Bell, to lose her life on yesterday. And so what I'd like us to do as we support Elite Scholars Academy, the school in which she attended, as we support her family and her peers, the faculty and staff, I'd like us to pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. So today, if for no other reason, as we learn about the state of the children here in Clayton County, I want to encourage all of us to think about Imani Bell. Think about what we can do, the role that we should play and fulfill to ensure that all of our children are well here in Clayton County. 
We want to thank the, the United Way as one of the leading sponsors and agencies, all of our partners, all of those who are here today for walking with us on this journey. Here in Clayton County, we are committed to high performance, but we recognize that there are many variables that impact the level of performance that our students can and will achieve. There are many impacts within the classroom, and there are many impacts outside of the classroom. The complexity of our work is certain, but when you have a committed village, as I believe Clayton County is very much committed to its children, when you have a committed village, then the work becomes doable. So we want to thank you for helping us make this work doable. Thank you for being here on today. Thank you, United Way. Thank you for working with us, walking alongside us, taking this journey to high performance with us, helping us to address all the variables that we should, we're empowered to address in order for our children to be well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beasley. Again, my name is Crystal Black Mills and I'm the advisory board chair for the United Way of Clayton County. And on behalf of the advisory board and United Way, we also would like to say welcome and thank you. We're happy to see each and every one of you here. We are happy to share the work that is being done through the United Way in Clayton County. We're excited about our partnerships, especially with Clayton County Public Schools. We're excited to share the efforts that have been made that have been resulted in positive change for Clayton County. And we're even more excited about the conversation that will come forth today to talk about what is yet to come. I am not gonna spend a lot of time before you this morning, but before I depart, I do want to ask that we recognize all of our elected officials that are with us today. If you all can please stand to be recognized. And I would be remiss not to take an opportunity to ask all of my fellow colleagues on the advisory board for United Way Clayton County, please stand and also be recognized. Again, we thank each and every one of you for being with us today and we hope you enjoy the program. Welcome Jenna Baugh, Vice President, Strategic Impact, United Way of Greater Atlanta. So I have a question for you. How are the children? Show of hands if you have a child. Show of hands if you know a child. Um, you guys are all here because you care about children, especially the children of Clayton County. And I know that you have been a child. And so when we start talking about child well-being, we want to bring those thoughts to mind. We want to bring that question to the forefront in the sense that we all care for these children. We care about the kids in our own families, but also those that one day will be your next employee the ones that might be going through something in another community next door, across the county line. You care about where they end up. You care about what they have going on in their lives right now. And so when we talk about child well-being, we're bringing that to the forefront. We really have a big there. We have a big aspiration. We want to make sure that every community is a place with high child well-being, where all children have the resources, opportunities, and social supports to reach their full potential. And so that means that children have to be doing well, but also their families. Their families have to be strong and thriving. And families don't grow up and thrive in isolation. They have to be in strong, nurturing communities. And for us, when we talk about child well-being, it means putting those three pieces together, the child, the family and the community, and making sure that they are all thriving. Thank you. 
I need a little assist. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, we started this journey a couple of years ago and we had some data. And so folks know that I'm, I'm here to bring some data and some information um, and sometimes it's not always the brightest picture. Two years ago, we worked on a bunch of data pieces, just like you try to figure out how your own family's doing or how your health is. The doctor can run a hundred tests. Um, and we had a hundred different ways that people were talking about and measuring child well-being. And so United Way said we can't follow all that at once. And leaders were asking us to put together a simpler way to look at child well-being. And so we came up with the Child Well-Being Index. And it's got 14 measures that talk about children, families, and communities. And when we put those data pieces together, we not only had a number, but we also created a map. And that map showed us something that some folks knew and some folks were really surprised about. Um, when you look at it, we said, okay, the lowest areas, the places where there are so many barriers for children reaching their full potential, those were places with a score less than 40, and those are red on the map. The places with really high child well-being were dark green on this map, and those are places with scores above an 88, um, and everybody else in between along the spectrum. The other thing we did is see how many children are we really talking about that have those barriers to their full potential. And this wasn't 100 kids, this wasn't enough to fill this room, a couple hundred or a couple thousand, we were talking about almost 500,000 children growing up in low child well-being communities across our region. And that was really troubling. Uh, the other thing that we knew is that we needed a single point to measure this. And so we looked at the score of 58.9 as saying that's not where we want to be on this journey talking about how we measure and look at child well-being. So we launched a movement. And for United Way, we knew, just like the superintendent mentioned and just like Crystal mentioned, it takes all of us. We could not do this without some support. And so that's why it's important to recognize it's a movement. We need everybody on board making those kind of changes. And the map was one of those pieces that galvanized a lot of folks, including Raphael Bostic at the Federal Reserve. So this isn't just about heartstrings. It makes good business sense. It makes good money sense to invest in child well-being. And they joined us, and part of this quote says, it's important because it's really the pathway by which you get to a region being fully self-sufficient for people from all walks of life to have a way to improve their realities and really try to realize their dreams. And this is one of those examples. We have tons of leaders, just like you saw in the video, just like you see from Raphael Bostic, that are really energized behind this cause of child well-being that it makes sense to the Federal Reserve that we look at our region through the lens of the children. So in this couple of years, we've seen a lot of great improvements. We're excited to announce that there's been improvements for more than 82,000 children that those conditions are really starting to change. The things that you're doing, the things that we're all doing are starting to pay off. And so this 82,000 children comes from things like improving conditions in those places that were red and orange on the map. More than 6% reduction in that size of those red and orange communities. We've seen 6.3 point improvement in high school graduation as a region. That's a huge gain in just a couple of years. The other thing that we're really proud of is that that's not just happening in one place, but it's certainly a trend that everybody is benefiting from. And college and career readiness, the kind of thing that you want, not just for children to graduate from high school, but you want them to be ready for the future, ready for the next stage of their life. And that also is improving. So this is where we started. And I make you draw your attention to that red and orange on the map. And then we talked about where we want to go. We'll click the next one. And then look at the map now. We've made huge gains in redu reducing that red and orange on the map. 
And that's something to celebrate, including getting to a 61.8 as a region. So you're here talking about the region, Jenna, but what about Clayton? And this is something that really deserves a round of applause. Clayton County has seen a five-point improvement in their child well-being score. <laughs> you know, we can't claim victory, but we can claim progress. And you all should be really, really proud. This is part of an entire community and the movement of what it means to be focused on child well-being. We're really excited to see this happen. A lot of times we put effort in and we're not exactly sure or we're waiting and waiting. And so having this kind of gain in such a short period says everybody's paying attention. It says lots of good factors are moving. Go on. So let me tell you about some of the things specific to Clayton County that have improved. And that if you're part of it, you probably recognize this. You probably feel it a little bit. Um, but there are things that everybody really needs to celebrate. High school graduation rates are improving, and that's such a big deal. We know that that drives lots of people's attention, whether that's where you buy a house or how you feel as a teacher on the front lines. But this kind of thing is not just about where you are, but look at the amount of the gain. A nine-point gain in two years says there's lots and lots of good work happening that this is the kind of thing that means it's happening inside the school, it's happening outside the school, it's happening from parents putting attention in, it's increasing the stability of families, there's lots of good things happening when you see that kind of gain. There are fewer families with a housing cost burden. Now I know sometimes folks think, well we hear a lot about that in the news, when you think what's happened over the past two years, we've had a long way to go to keep making sure that housing is not a burden to families, that they're not paying more than 30% on their housing during their year. And more adults have health insurance. These are the kinds of factors that have to all play in a positive direction in order for us to see that kind of gain of five points. And we're really excited to see these kinds of meaningful changes in Clayton County specifically. So I want to talk about some of the things that are behind that. How do you get it to happen? We mentioned a little bit earlier, you heard some about collaboration. And one of the things that we want to lift up is the fact that even as opportunities arise, even as good stuff starts happening, you got to have the right partners. And not only do you have to have the right partners, part of what we're really seeing happening is that the partners are prepared. They're ready for that next level. That's part of why United Way invested so much in collaboration. How do we make sure that both the nonprofits, the leaders from different sectors, whether that's somebody from the city government, um, it could be in College Park or Forest Park, it's also about school leaders coming together and the nonprofits being ready. Because you've got to make changes and you need leaders that are ready to collaborate, that they have the same values, the right mindset, just like you pick the right running buddy. So if you're going to go do the 5K, you want somebody who's with you along a journey, not somebody who points at it and says, yep, go have fun, I'll be on the couch. So we're putting a lot of energy into that and we think that's part of why the improvements are happening in this great way, that Clayton County really is focused on collaboration and that the leaders and partners are ready to do that. The other thing that we've done in a very different way is we put youth in the center. We focused on getting information from people who are part of the experience. We've also done something where you could do a focus group and kind of walk off, anybody done a survey before and you get to give some input, but instead we're asking youth to be co-designers. We're bringing forth the people who are part of this and saying, you know what's best. Help us do this. When we bring those youth together, when we bring leaders and families together, it is a very, very different way of designing a program. It's not just experts, but it's putting all those pieces together, and United Way is really excited about fueling that. So we're excited about the progress in Clayton County. And if you do nothing else today, I want you to ask somebody, how are the children?
Good morning, my name is Rachel McBride and I am a student at North Clayton High School. I am a 10th grader there and I have lived in College Park for my entire life. I've been fed through North Cut Elementary, North Clayton Middle, and North Clayton High, so I've never experienced anything outside of the city. I've, I've been in this Performing Arts Center too many times to count, and some of my best memories stem from this city. And the same thing does not go for many of my peers and many of my friends since elementary school, I've had to deal with people that I've been extremely close to moving away, moving back, and my relationships with them have been very unsteady. And those, many of those relationships are ones that could have been extremely beneficial to me if I had the opportunity to, to nurture them. And that's a huge part of what the Brighter Future Youth Leadership Council aims to eradicate. It's an issue called student mobility. And many people do not know what this term student mobility means. It's basically the moving of families from home to home, which results in many things. And a key part being students moving from institution to institution. And the Brighter Future Youth Leadership Council aims to solve problems surrounding student mobility that specifically apply to the youth. And I am a co-chair of this project and my charge is bringing awareness to the issue and being a voice to my peers. And what causes student mobility, for one, is things like housing instability, housing crises, wage problems, the various apartment complexes here. It enables the constant moving of families from place to place, even within the county. Clayton County has one of the highest rates of student mobility in the state of Georgia, and some families have been recorded to move within eight times in one school year. And what the Youth Council has been investigating are the effects and detriments of that, it's specifically on the youth, on the children, because it is very important to focus on our foundation, which is the youth. And a lot of the blame gets assigned to the structures that be in the school system, but I have to disagree with that because I believe that flourishing in comfort is a real thing. It does not matter what environment you are in, it does not matter the systems that be. If you are comfortable and you know how to manipulate your resources to your benefit, then you can thrive anywhere. And I believe that I'm a, I can attest to that because I've never had to worry about moving. I've never had to worry about where I'm going to go next and how to reacclimate myself and thus being able to focus on school and being able to focus on building relationships with people has come easy to me because I've been able to focus on those things. But for many, they don't have that privilege. And especially the youth, when you move, you have to get accustomed to new curriculum, you have to get acclimated to new people and that leaves a very narrow space for doing much else. And when you're comfortable and you know what you're going into, you can produce greatness. And being a community, I feel like, is another issue that surrounds student mobility. Because when we see Clayton as home, and when we see it as the place where we are together, then we can build upon each other. And I believe that home is extremely important, especially when you're trying to produce. You have to plant seeds in order for plants to grow. And it's possible to run a hundred-legged race if everybody's on the same foot. So I've thought of the passing of Imani Bell, and I did not know her personally, but I know many of her friends. and. I know that it is extremely important that we have familial ties because I know Imani will not be forgotten because 
we can learn so much from elite scholars. The students, they mourn together. And we all know that they will rise together because they see their people and their friends as home. She will not be forgotten because she was surrounded by love. And when we think of issues like this, we also have to think of, we have to ask ourselves the major questions like, what do we need more of? Do we need more structural integrity? Do we need more housing stability? What is the problem and how do we eradicate that? And that is a huge part of what the Brighter Future Youth Leadership Council has been focused on, building those ties and focusing on the children and making sure that we are looking out for each other's well-being. And I'm sure that with the support of each other and with the support of the community, that we'll, we will be able to solve these problems that surround us and our youth and specifically student mobility. So I thank you all and I, I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Please welcome Katrina Mitchell, Chief Community Impact Officer, United Way of Greater Atlanta. Katrina will also be serving as our moderator for today's panel discussion. It's a wonderful day to be here, and this is an exciting opportunity for us to have this conversation here. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit with you about why we're here and emphasize why United Way sees this as an important opportunity to have a conversation. So one, our basic premise is that in order for us to dramatically improve those child well-being scores, we have to do it together. No longer can we do it separately. We need to be a catalyst to increase the services for families and children in these communities. We need to ensure, particularly as the United Way, how do we invest in those data-driven solutions that ensure that children and families thrive? We want to make sure that we foster those strategic partnerships. How do we ensure that sectors work with each other, that state agencies work with local community partners, that school systems work with philanthropy, that businesses work with families? And we also want to leverage the strengths of the entire community. That is, how do we harness the power of that collective leadership in our communities? So again, I am so grateful to be here to moderate this panel and to really have an opportunity to talk to some important leaders in your community about how we see our work forward and how we work together to ensure that all of our children and families thrive. So with that, we'll get ready for the panel. Thank you so much, Katrina. Before we introduce our panelists for this discussion this morning, I want to point out that you received some cards as you came in today. During the discussion, if you want to write down a question and pass it to the ends of the aisles, we will address those questions during our Q&A session. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Morcise Beasley, Shannon James, Dietrich Stanford, Representative Rhonda Bernot, and Representative Valencia Stovall. today is to not just talk about all the challenges in our communities, but what the opportunities are. And we are here on this stage, I'm here on this stage with some amazing leaders in this community, um, and obviously so many more amazing leaders out here in the audience. And we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about 
not just what the challenges again are, but what the opportunities are, what this community has to offer, the amazing leadership and partnerships, and what those strategic solutions are to really being able to ensure that children and families um, can thrive. I want to start a little bit of talking about that collective leadership, because an important part of this child well-being movement to us at United Way is that we really harness the power of leaders, right? Those are resident leaders, those are your civic and community leaders, those are residents, and those are also young people, as you heard from Rachel. Um, and before we start, really think about the, a few important things. One, that zip code should no longer determine a child's success or quality of life, which we all agree with, right? And I think all of these leaders would agree with as well. That no one institution can do this alone. That is, we have to work in collaboration. No longer can we attack and really be able to work on some of these challenges by ourselves. And then the third and most important thing is that we really want the strong supports for children and families that are essential, and that we really want to value the power of the place and history of the communities that we're serving, right? And the last one that I always try to remind people is that this work takes time and commitment and dedication. That real change that we're requiring takes the time and commitment of resources by all of us and doesn't fit in a grant cycle, right? This is long-term work. So I'm going to start with a few questions, and we will also have um, an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. And I think I'll start right here to my left. Uh, my first question, State Representative Burroughs, is what role do you see government has as leading and advancing this child well-being work and building an economy that really is going to ensure that all children and families thrive? that um, as, um, as an elected official, um, our responsibility is to make sure that um, the policies that we vote on and that we present are policies that are favorable for our families. Um, a lot of times, um, sometimes people will ask us for different legislation, and sometimes th there are things that, um, sometimes there are things that, can, that we can do, and then sometimes it's something personal. But when we make our decisions, they have to be for the overall community. And so that's what we look for when we're deciding on what legislation for Clayton County is going to benefit the entire county. And, and, and that includes our families. And Dr. Beasley, same question. What role do you see the education system and leaders like yourself really playing in advancing this work? Well, I think that's a great question. I, I would say that the school system is uniquely positioned to bring so many of the people together around the children. Uh, we're uh, the ones who have the children at least 180 days out of the year, right, in our schools. And so we are positioned to bring everyone, and at least invite everyone to the table, to have conversations about what needs to happen to really move our children forward. I think we also have to inform people. Sometimes people look at reading scores and math scores and they think that the outcomes are all based upon one input, and that would be just that one teacher in the classroom or that one principal. But there are many variables that impact outcomes, and the, the school system is uniquely positioned to share and help inform the community as to, yes, what we're doing to improve reading and math and science and social studies outcomes, but what are the other impacts that will help us improve the reading, the math, the science, and social studies outcomes if they are addressed. And that's why we need our elected officials and our other agencies and governments, et cetera, to work on those structures that we know, that we know impact the quality of life for individuals and communities, those structures that are in place. Because honestly, if some of those structures were not in place, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, and Shannon, if you would talk a little bit about the business community um, and what you see as the critical role and the role that the business community plays as well. Absolutely. Uh, good question and great answers by our panelists. Uh, I do want to pause for a moment and, and recognize Imani Bell. Uh, you know, having someone, and we're having this conversation about child well being, mm -hmm. and uh, ironically enough, we're uh, unfortunate to celebrate her life today. And so I just want to take a moment to recognize Imani and our condolences to her family, friends, loved ones. Uh, but to speak directly uh, about business, uh, 
you know, coming from the banking world uh, historically uh, is extremely important. Uh, one thing that I am much of an advocate of is community engagement, but more so from the corporate side, uh, because the corporate entities are our job centers. And typically those job centers are your wealth creators. And so if the job centers aren't thinking about how they're impacting communities uh, versus uh, return on investment, then it's a, it's a tilted scale. And so the scale has to be balanced uh, in order to have real impact. And so our mission is to not only, as an organization, the Aerotropolis Atlanta Alliance, uh, it's not only recruit companies and businesses to the area, uh, but to also make sure that we're very cognizant of the impacts that they bring uh, in regards to identifying what economic inclusion looks like. Uh, you know, we've been working very closely with our good friends at Annie E. Casey Foundation. Matter of fact, uh, Executive Director Kwaku Forstall is in the building. Uh, they're very much so thought leaders, and so when, when you think about collaboration and partnership, uh, it truly takes a village. And so we're pulling from our resources at the table and thinking thoughtfully about how are we, uh, you know, not only advocating for growth and development, uh, but also very conscientious about displacement. And we're thinking about inclusion and what this talent pipeline looks like as it relates to those areas that those corporations are located. Uh, what does that community benefit looks like uh, as it relates to the requirements or expectations of those corporations uh, in regards to career pathways and talent pipelines. So it's, it's extremely important. All of those components play roles in the factors of growth and uh, collective growth versus, uh, you know, only a segment of growth. And so uh, we're very cognizant of that and we understand the importance. And so that's why we're very intentional about our partnerships and very thoughtful in our approach in how we channel that dialogue and not making it so much of a uh, tilted scale to fear them away, uh, but to also help them understand what they're walking into and the expectations of the community and their level of engagement to help the, ent the growth entirely versus just for that space that they're holding. So I'm going to go to State Representative Stovall and then come back to Dietrich because I want Dietrich to also talk specifically about Clayton County and what's happening here. But State Representative Stovall, would you share with us what do you see the role again as an elected official in this important work? Well, first of all, I want to thank the United Way for um, seeing that Clayton County um, is a special place um, for needing additional resources and support and the magnitude that United Way brings with them to our community. So I do want to say that at first. Um, I think as an uh, elected official, uh, policies matter. And policies are the ones that drive what can and cannot be done in a community. Um, the policies that we implement down at the state capitol uh, decides when it comes to early learning, which is our foundation. Uh, what can be done, what can be taught, the curriculum. And then it funnels into our K through 12 um, system as well as the flexibility that the school districts are allowed to have uh, when it comes to how they're executing or distributing education. And then it goes up to higher ed and then even into the work, workplace with public-private partnerships. And without those public-private partnerships like um, Atlanta Aerotropolis um, Alliance, we cannot um, do what we need to do in the, um, as elected officials. So all of those play a part because you talk, start talking about workforce and talk about talent pipeline. But if the policies are not in place to allow that flexibility and that has, has actually been tre tremendously done pretty good in Georgia because we're the number one state uh, to do business, but that's because of policies. So having um, elected officials in place that are willing to make those bold steps um, to, be able to make sure the policies are in place so everything else can run um, like it should. It's all on the wheel and all the turn parts of the wheel have to turn but the policies are not there, then it can restrict the growth that we have. And I'm uh, very happy, you know, that we are here having this conversation about our child well-being, because that's, those children are our future. But if we don't set the foundation now to make sure they have that foundation in education so they can become productive citizens. 
Cedric, again, the role of government. I think this is a really important one, but also Clayton has a historical perspective about how important the government has been and what the development has been and the progress that we've seen in terms of the partnerships and work. So could you share a little bit more about what you see the role is and kind of some historical perspective about where we are today? Certainly, Katrina. So um, first of all, I echo the sentiments of my panelists as it pertains to um, just the, the thoughts and the um, appreciation to United Way and seeing the value of having this conversation. And so um, what I think is analogous to the Clayton County story, um, if everyone can imagine in the early 90s, Clayton County was a predominantly um, white, non-Hispanic community, uh, pretty suburban type community. We talked about about 150,000 people that lived in the community. So imagine fast forwarding 30 years later, to now having a predominantly African-American community that, that's bubbling somewhere in the upwards of 287,000 residents. And as Representative Stovall alluded to earlier, the problem with a lot of that is that the policies that were prevalent in 1990 are no longer prevalent in 2019. So if we're not making those policy changes to keep up with the demographic shifts that are happening within our community, then we're doing our community a major disservice. Now, our elected officials and our appointed officials have done a yeoman's job in talking about, you know, making those changes, but unfortunately, if we're still trying to catch up from 1990 to 2019, even the policy change for 2019 is no longer prevalent. We need to be thinking about where the community needs to be five and 10 years down the road. So it takes courageous leadership in that space to talk specifically about those changes, and that's kind of the microcosm of our change right now. Um, that we recognize that the policies that are in place right now probably are not representative of our community, but we also know that we can't stop to 2019. We need to talk about 2030, we need to talk about 2040, and are we making those requisite changes at this time? Absolutely. All right, so I want us to get into the conversation because we really want to talk about solutions also, right? We've seen progress just in our region. Um, Jenna talked a little bit about the progress that Clayton has had. Um, United Way has invested in solutions and supporting um, partners in doing that work and increasing the resources. But I'd love to hear if Dr. Beasley, you could start a little bit about some of those strategies and solutions. You know, what is the work that you see that's happening, the progress we're seeing, and what solutions do you think we really need to be putting in place to really change the trajectory of the children and families in this community? Thank you. I, I think Rachel mentioned the word mobility. And so, yes, we're working on reading scores and math scores. We're teaching standards, if you will. But our team is also working collaboratively with the city government, United Way, and other entities within the county to address the mobility. We're working with the magistrate's office to look at uh, homelessness, et cetera. Because there are some systems that are in place that contribute to the high mobility rate in Clayton County. When you have one out of three of your students on any given day coming or going, those are systems. And so what can we do to address that? Is it family income issue? Is it uh, a policy issue relative to housing? What is the issue? What's causing homelessness? Why is a family, if they experience eviction one time, then why does it become easy for others to deny them a place to live? And so we're working to see what we can do collectively, clearly, to address those types of structures and systems. And so, yes, I can bring to the table the information about how our kids are doing in reading and math and what we're doing specifically to improve reading and math outcomes. But I can't improve the outcomes the way they should be improved if they're leaving one out of three continue to leave every day. And so I need the government, I need the magistrate's office, I need elected officials to look at our policies and our laws to see what can we do to basically disrupt these bad systems that are contributing to. All of us who work with families and children, our families want their children to be successful. And I can assure you that families don't just want to move and take their children out of good schools they often make decisions that businesses make every day. They want to spread that dollar as far as it can what? It can go. And so what can we do to provide them those opportunities to spread the dollar, but also to stabilize the child's attendance in school so the teachers and the principals and counselors and all can do what we need to do with that child every day to ensure that they have a brighter uh, future of many opportunities. So addressing those systems. 
Patrick, I'd love to hear a little bit more because I know that you all have been working on this housing question, right? And maybe you all, others will pipe in a little bit because I think you said two things, Dr. Beasley, that are important. One is that part of this systems change work means that we have to operate differently, right? That's one thing. We've got to do work differently. We've got to work with different folks. Um, and then the second thing you said was you've got to attack that root cause, right? Because families want the best for their children, absolutely. Every family wants the best for their children. Um, but part of what we want to be able to do is not think about it as though children live their lives just in school. They just live their lives, their health lives over here and their education lives over here. No, it's integrated. Every family has to think about all those issues. So I would love to talk a little bit about this housing question because I think it's important to see the connection between what happens academically in your school building as well as the work that has to happen to think about some of those root causes. Well, Dr. Beasley hit it on the head. I think um, what we recognize in our collaborative work environment is that we can't continue to work in silos. So if the county government or the cities collectively don't know what the disconnect is as to why kids are not being able to attend school because we're not even, it's nowhere on our radar screen, then we're doing our community a major disservice. Um, I think part of uh, the collaborative relationship has spoken to, one, understanding our space, understanding our lanes, and then trying to figure out how do we continue to draw upon our respective strengths for the betterment of the collective community. The other part of that I think is important is that we got to know what we're measuring, right? I think oftentimes everybody has a different perspective of what success should look like in their communities. And so you have to have a set of analytics that is representative of ultimately what are we all working towards. And I use the analogy oftentimes about playing pickup basketball. And so the goal is there when you're just shooting hoops and you know you're your friends and you're not keeping score, nobody really cares. But the, the, it kind of gets ginned up when you start keeping score because now you know that there's an end goal. And so the matrix and the analytics that we're trying to put around or wrap around all of our services that we all have to have a common goal as to what the measure it the measurement matrix should be, and then ultimately work towards that. It does two things. The community at least know what the governments are shooting for, and then ultimately, if we fall short, then they know what to hold us accountable for. And so ultimately, we recognize that as being kind of the foundation of a lot of our work, and the collaborative work relationships certainly has benefited us as a whole. Um, and um, State Representative Stovall and even State Representative Bernal, I would love to hear a little bit more about the policy changes that impact some of this. So we talked a little bit about you got to have the policy changes, right? It's those practical solutions. But what are some of the policy changes and the work that you see both happening at the local level and at the state level that really will help to support what's Before happening? Answer, Katrina, sure. I should share that we're in the process uh, we're working with a few agencies with the magistrate's office and there will be at some point some recommended legislation that we'll, we'll be forwarding to our delegation. So I don't know if, they, if they've if they even had a conversation with uh, Judge Dallas as of yet, but that will be coming. So I don't know if that's a premature question relative to this specific topic. Yeah. Well, it might be that there's other things like what you see coming down the pike from the state representative, state legislature in terms of policy around early childhood, around some other work. So I wonder if you share a little bit of what that might contribute to that as well. Um, well, I start off, um, like I mentioned earlier about um, policies and even that private-public partnership is very, very important. Um, some of the things we've done, I serve on the Education Committee uh, on the House and small business development and economic development and tourism. So being able to see from a statewide perspective um, and then now honing it down to, to Clayton County uh, makes a huge difference. Um, like with the state of Georgia, we have the High Career Demand Initiative. And with that initiative, um, it allows individuals, adults, to be able to get, uh, obtain training and short-term training um, from six, maybe uh, 18, six weeks all the way up to maybe two years. And most of the time, even the people that are living here um, in Clayton County will probably qualify for that free training. Uh, when you talk about student mobility, it all boils down to in housing, boils down to the income. If I can't afford to live in a certain place, I'm going to have to move. So 30, my 30 days are up in this apartment, now I'm going to have to move to another apartment. My 30 days are up from this apartment, I'm going to have to move to another apartment. And that's very unstable for our young people, and even for the adults, when you start talking about the mental part that comes to plays in, uh, plays in with it. So I think that the disconnect is, the silos that um, Dietrich mentioned, and a lot of times our community don't know about those opportunities that are available. 
for whatever reason, only a handful might know about it, but it's not spreading across the, um, with the masses. And I think that when we are able to talk more about those workforce uh, opportunities that are available, the training that's available um, in our communities, even with we, the dual enrollment program that the school system has been partnering with our uh, higher ed with, makes a huge difference because now you're talking about how do we look at what the future is going to look like. So we start with our younger kids with early learning, a lot of things right now with the quality rated, um, that each early learning center and family center would now have to be quality rated by 2020, which means that there's a standard that we have set across the state as was what early learning should look like. And those centers that have not um, started participating are going to be closed down. And so what does that look like for our community? But we have to start somewhere. We're starting at the beginning of the pipeline, and then that pipeline expands. So those policies like that have been put in place, but if they're not utilized, then they become dormant. And you have other communities outside of Clayton that are really taking advantage of it. But we have to do a better job, and not even myself, at communicating that out to our general public, that these opportunities are available, and they're low to no cost. And if we can start moving that poverty needle from deliverable wages and moving it up, and even with start with programs within our school system, then at the same time, we're hitting all of those marks that we don't have to have this conversation come next year. We'll be talking about another conversation of all these huge companies that are coming in because our workforce now shows that we have individuals that are capable of handling those higher wages jobs that are out there that are going everywhere else except for here in Clayton County. Representative Stovall really just hit the nail on the head, and I wanted to just chime in only because our mission as an organization uh, is very much so that. Um, you know, we have a, a very much focus on workforce development component of our initiative, and a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people just kind of see on the surface the economic development, the growth, the promotion side of it, uh, but we're also drilling down on those very topics of making sure that residents now have access to free training, right? So at no cost. And the really is the access to information. That is the greatest commodity known to man, uh, information. And so now that we've become more intentional with our cities, we're now pushing those training programs out through our municipalities, through our various partnerships, whether it's uh, you know, Atlanta Career Rise or uh, United Way. Uh, we, the goal is to now help promote that information out for these training programs that our organization is very much so trying to propel as a region because you know companies can look in the area all they want, and if they do decide to locate here, then they're looking for the talent, right? And so you either have the skill set to now meet the demand, or ultimately you become even more mobilized, right? Because now you can't afford to come back if you wanted to. So the goal for our organization is to make sure that information is disseminated, uh, that we're partnering with organizations like Generation, uh, that specialize in curriculum and training people, and then placing them, not just from a training mechanism, but also placement and then following how sustainable that is. Uh, we've been successful in hospitality and construction so far. We've trained north of 220 plus individuals within our region, and we have north of a 90% placement rate. But if you think through that, right, you drill down uh, to the concept, and I just, I don't want to take too much time, but I, I try to think about myself and my, my life, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, my mother uh, went through a workforce training program. Uh, we didn't have access for her to, or we didn't have a car, so she couldn't get to, uh, to the job place. So they had a program where they picked her up in a van. It was Harambe Head Start. I think Head Start is still going on to this day. They picked her up, and then that allowed her to get training, and then they set a career path for her where she ended up becoming a center director for one of the largest centers in Albany, Georgia. But what that did, it allowed my family to then move into a space where we were more stationary, and then a boys and girls club opened up, and then it allowed me to gain resources from all of those mentors and that interaction, and it allowed me to think a lot bigger than my perceived notions of what I could be based on my environment. So without all of those mechanisms, uh, I wouldn't be here today. So it's important for us as an organization to think through how do we be an added resource to the county and to the government and to our public and private partners uh, to make sure that during this great economy, we're pushing that with two feet on the pedal. Because when the economy slows down, 
our area will actually be hurt the most uh, because it, statistics will tell you uh, anytime you've got data that exists like this and the economy slows, then those new jobs tend to pull back in our community. So uh, just wanted to commend Representative Stovall and, and add an echo from the Aerotropolis. So I guess to kind of put a bow on that from Representative Soval and Shannon's perspective is that you can't do that in a perspective of linear thinking, right? It's a very non-linear perspective. And part of the, the, the change that you see is that we're getting out of the space of being tactical and being more strategic about our direction. So whether or not the organization is a school system, whether they're looking at non-governmental organizations, our, our state leadership, county of the cities, what we recognize is that there's not just this line to get to the solution. We have to look at all those that reciprocal uh, resources that may provide context to the discussion and try to figure out how we put that in the barrel to make you know, ultimate decisions for the county and for the collective um, county as a whole. Yeah, um, I attended a workshop um, about a couple months ago. It was called uh, Neighborhood Work and Neighbors Work Together. And one of the things we have to go back to, as Representative Stovall said, is that communicating with our neighbors. Um, we have to be our neighbor's keeper. We have to go back and have those conversations and go back and share information. I know that a lot of times people come and they'll say, well, we have renters in our neighborhood, but we have to go and talk to our renters. We don't, we don't discriminate between one versus the other, but we bring them into the fold. And that's what we did in our um, neighborhood. We had an ice cream social. And so all the different neighbors were there, and so we got, had an opportunity to talk to them. And when you're talking to them in a more casual conversation, you find out what their needs are, what kind of information they need. And so then you begin to share that information with them. And so that empowers them to go out and also share information. Because we have a lot of information, but we need to get it out to make sure that our, our community knows exactly what's going on and what opportunities are available for them and for their students. Yeah, I think the, one of the things that you said I think is important is that one of the beliefs about this work and when you're doing this systems change work is that you also take the voice of community as a very important driver, right? So I'd love to hear some examples about how you all have ensured that the voices of community, that's either young people, residents, are all a part of thinking about what are the solutions and strategies you all are trying to move forward. And anybody could take a stab at that one first. Well, you heard Rachel. Rachel represents the voice of, of, of her generation. Uh, we, within the school system, we, we meet with our young people from all of the various schools consistently. Uh, we meet with our community, those who are willing to come. We like to hear what they have to say. Uh, and we take that information and we use it to inform the work that we're doing. Back to the previous uh, conversation about workforce development. So in Clayton County Public Schools, we've restructured our work-based work learning uh, leadership team to make sure that we're just not pushing kids into fast food jobs. We've got all these opportunities that exist. Sometimes it's just a matter of information getting to the school system. And so we've been working with the Aerotropolis and the various entities to close that gap. And once we're informed, then whether it's pushed out internally or we push it out to our community. Sometimes we push a lot of information out to our parents, hopeful that once they read it, they'll pass it along to someone in the family who may not be in the K-12 environment. That communication, as State Representative Bernal shared, we've got to share that information, but closing those gaps, but giving students voice uh, in very simple ways. Uh, from lunch, they want good lunch. Giving students voice about uh, what courses that they can take or dual enrollment options, or just voice about the challenges that they're dealing with. Peer pressure, social media, et cetera just giving students voice in a variety of ways. It happens at the classroom, the school level, and at the district level. But of course, ensuring that our kids are piped in, what happens at the Capitol? Voice, involvement, ensuring that on every day of the legislation, uh, the, that the legislative, is in, legis, legislative session is in motion, that we have students there who are seeing, who are reaching out to their elected officials, sharing their ideas, their thoughts. When we have in the school system, when we have critical issues going on in the nation, We'll pause and do a critical, issue, uh, critical issues lesson. Uh, we have a procedure. Here's a major issue, give students voice. That's very important. This is their world. Yeah, we have them for you know, 180 days, but what do we have them for? We have them to help them become critical thinkers 
users of information so that they can impact their world. One of the ways um, is host, host, hosting um, community forums, which we do um, individually and we do it collectively as a um, de delegation. And we, normally we do it, I know, for the delegation um, right before a session starts to kind of let everybody know what's getting ready to happen for those 40 days. And then after session is over with, and, um, and so is myself, is in between the intermediate, uh, intermediate um, time in between. And um, of course, using social media, but you know, sometimes it's not enough. Uh, I found that even with social media, is another form of word of mouth. And so being able to, um, you know, the audience being here today to be able to take their information back and even asking more questions. That's the other thing with our citizens here in Clayton County. They got to start asking more questions and demanding more services um, for what, what they're not receiving or should be receiving. That's the difference in other communities. They are asking about accountability. And there's elected officials as appointed uh, officials. We are responsible for being accountable to the community that we serve. And so if things are not going right, they see other things going on in other communities, you got to speak up and say, hey, why we don't have that? And then sometimes it might not, not, not have known that there's a possibility. But if the community is pushing and driving this conversation, which is why we're here today, that that's the only way our community is going to change when, um, when, as individuals and communities and even pushing our young people to be able to speak up, be critical thinkers about what they want to see the future of um, Clayton County and the state of Georgia to look like. Um, for me, communication is the most important thing. And even if you're um, in the grocery store, is that if you start to carry on conversations with children or individuals that are there, and just kind of get that way you get a feel for what's going on or what their needs are. I've also hosted um, some meetings uh, in my district, small, smaller meetings, because sometimes when people are in smaller groups, that each person has a chance to talk and they get to tell you what's going on with them. So one thing I found is that um, it is really important for us to allow people to bring their ideas to us. Um, sometimes when we're down at the Capitol and a lot's going on, and um, sometimes we think that we know what, what, they, what the residents need, but we have to allow them the opportunity to tell us what they need and then work on those things for them. Are you gonna add something? Yeah, so I think for, um, for the county to be specific, um, unsolicited plug here. Um, the Office of Youth Services, um, when we talk about the work specific to our youth, um, our Board of Commissioners saw it would be of value to create this Office of Youth, Office of youth Service. A byproduct of that is our Youth Commission. And so the spirit behind the Youth Commission is trying to ensure that our youth at a very early age is civically engaged and have an opportunity to impact policy now opposed to waiting until they're elected later on in life. So I think that has been certainly has been a, a yeoman's and a, a plus for the county as a whole. The other that talks to what we think is a poster child for our, our relationship primarily with the school system is our career pathway um, opportunities um, from, the, from a state perspective and even the southeast. And I think this certainly deserves a round of applause is our firefighter EMS pathway. You have an opportunity for our youth um, starting in the 10th grade to learn some of the requisite skill sets that are needed and working directly with our firefighters. And ultimately, we hope that it would translate into an employment opportunity once they get out of high school. Well, what does that do? When we talk about upping our household medium income, not only are we providing opportunities for employment, but also what we're doing is keeping our youth in the county. Oftentimes, they go and transition out, and they get this great education and go into other communities. But we want to keep our kids right here in the community. So that career pathway opportunity that we're working in conjunction with the school system is what I would say is a good, um, a good representation of some of the things that we're doing now that is different than what we've done in the past. Yeah, I think that's great. You, you've transitioned wonderfully to hearing some of those proof points, the progress we're seeing. So I wonder if you all would talk a little bit more about what are some of those examples of the right work. One of the things that we strongly believe at United Way is we not only have to invest in innovation, right, incubating and testing new ideas, um, but we also want to accelerate what works, right? How do we work with partners like Andrew Casey Foundation, other organizations to really be able to put all of our resources together to accelerate and scale what works? So maybe Shannon, you could start a little bit because we talk so much about the workforce and the economic mobility you get to see across the region, not just here in Clayton, but what is it 
we need to accelerate here in Clayton to really be able to get traction in this place? Well, I think, uh, very good question. Uh, you know, I think, Diedrich, everyone has really been speaking on it, uh, but it's really removing yourself from the silo approach uh, and working collectively. Uh, you know, what we've found is collaboration uh, and partnership in a very intentional way uh, really yields the outcomes that we, we're all talking about, we're all aspiring to. So the more we're communicating collectively and becoming more intentional about how we're working together, uh, it really starts to move the needle. And so when you've got uh, organizations like communities and schools who are, are very adamant about uh, child well-being and improving the status of communities uh, as it correlates to the school systems, when you've got the Annie Cases of the world uh, who are very adamant about uh, economic inclusion and, and racial equity, uh, you know, you, you have to really understand how do we as an organization, for sure as the Aerotropolis, serve as a conduit to make sure that communication is happening across lines, right? So we're not duplicating efforts. Uh, we're not, you know, tripping over ourselves uh, versus becoming more intentional and, and more uh, focused on partnership. And so what we've seen, uh, and, and I think a great example is through our workforce development efforts. Uh, in the state of Georgia, in our region, we consider the Aerotropolis, there are several work source areas uh, that exist. You have work source Fulton, uh, you have WorkSource Atlanta, you got WorkSource Clayton. I mean, you've got several different WorkSource Georgias that exist within this corridor. And what that does, it creates confusion for job seekers or employers who are seeking uh, the ability to find talent and have the free resources to train uh, and bring in that talent, right? So as an organization, we were that can do it to listen to the entire region and say, okay, how do we create an individual who's focused on that day, night, you know, morning sleep, if you will, to try and be a channel uh, to help cut down on that confusion. And so uh, through our partnerships with WorkSource Georgia, we created uh, WorkSource Aerotropolis, uh, a gentleman by the name of Clinton Covington. Uh, so if you guys don't know or haven't met Clinton, uh, Clinton is housed in the Aerotropolis office, and his mission is to help job seekers find placement and, and also companies uh, find job seekers, and what he does, he helps find those opportunities where it's at no cost or at basically at best no low cost uh, to the employee and the job seeker. So, you know, the more we continue to communicate, the more we continue to convene, uh, especially as leadership, no question uh, will the needle be moved, uh, but we have to do it in a very intentional way. Uh, and I'll give one other last example. Uh, is that our organization created an education collective. You heard Dr. Beasley mention that. And so we intentionally partner with the school systems of Clayton County, who Dr. Beasley serves as our chair, and Dr. Gina Whitaker, who's the area superintendent for South Fulton. So now we're being intentional about our region and how do we deploy our resources at the table to make sure that we're empowering uh, the future generation uh, to become even more sustainable. There are many successes. Uh, Shannon mentioned the Aerotropolis. We have an event on October 18th mm -hmm. that right. will serve all of our high schools in Clayton County and all the high schools clearly in South Fulton where we will connect our young people to employers that they probably would not be connected to otherwise. So we, we're planning to do that. Of course, Clayton County has partnered with all of the various colleges and universities, Clayton State University, Atlanta Tech, Atlanta Metro, We've seen, of course, we graduated for the first time over 3,000 students this year. 71 of them earned associate degrees with over 500 participating in dual enrollment opportunities. So we're seeing successes, but it takes time to see more. Uh, at one point, we only had, we had one in four kids uh, at reading and doing math at grade level. Now it's, it's, it's one in three, so we're improving. It takes time, strategy and time, uh, and it takes people collaborating, coming together. Uh, we're, we're expected to see more of our kids participate in workforce development opportunities. I, I think we're closing that gap, so our community is getting informed. And we're seeing, we're seeing, as the Child Wellbeing Index is testifying to, we're seeing our data going in the right direction. We've just got to continue to do more of that, maintain our focus, and celebrate our successes, tweak the areas that we need to tweak, and continue to build on the successes that we're experiencing. Absolutely, go ahead, Dr. Uh, yes. uh, I belong to the women of Clayton, 
And uh, <clears throat> they did a, a great campaign where they were collecting uh, books for our students in our, in our class, schools, and, and pajamas. And that was a really successful program. And we went and we uh, passed the books out. So we're also getting other organizations that are coming in. They might be smaller, but they're working with us also to help improve um, the literacy here in the school. Ms. Say when you talk about um, solutions and things that, that are now in place, uh, we fought very hard to get Atlanta Technical College to have a campus here um, in, uh, in Clayton County on Highway 85. How many of you all knew about Atlanta Tech is now in Clayton County? See, that goes back when I say communication and getting the information out. Uh, and so with that, that brings what we talked about, workforce um, development and training, now it's more localized uh, because we now have a higher uh, institute of education, when you start talking about short-term training, that now individuals can be able to go and access the high career demand initiatives, which are 17 industries that the state of Georgia has sought and seen that we don't have enough people in those, in those industries to fill that, that, that workspace. So now we have Atlanta Tech that's there, um, open and wed, ready and willing to be able to service Clayton County and other areas, but more specifically, we're talking about Clayton, Clayton County. Um, other things is like the International um, Painters Union um, has taken a, a, a huge look into um, Clayton County and partnering with the school system on some type of apprenticeship um, programs. And so when you start talking about higher wages, you know, we have young people that will be able to, um, upon completion of the program, able to earn a minimum of $14 an hour, and even adults being able to participate in their program. And even with Atlanta Technical College, has two types of apprenticeship programs, one that's a German-style apprenticeship programs that can be participating in. So when we look at the business community, for them getting, being able to get involved in that as well, and then there you have the U.S. Um, Department of Labor that has an apprenticeship program as well. But those types of things working hand in hand is what's going to build, uh, you know, build us up as far as that. Another thing um, that we've been doing, um, I just recently held a back to school event, um, and that that we strategically put in there, make sure resources um, were there, were organizations to be able to give out information to be able to help our general community as a whole as to what's actually going on in Clayton. What do we have here? Because a lot of times people think they have to go outside the county to get resources, but it's here, they just don't know about it. So I just go keep going back to those silos and us communicating better. And it's gonna take all of us taking our portion that we're specialized in and then uniting as one, like United Way, uniting as, uh, as one to make sure that we're servicing our community. I think we're going to take a pause from questions from the audience, but I want to thank our panelists for really starting to spur a conversation, right? And so I hope that you all have cards and that you all have completed the cards with your questions um, and passed them to the aisle so that we can take. I have a couple of um, questions that came in earlier that I can start with as we get those. Um, but I wanted to just emphasize something that you all said that I want us to come back to and that is that everybody has a role in this work, right? And so I think you've all given examples where leaders, folks in different positions, right, in positions that you all have to influence change in your community, but also your average everyday citizen, right? How do I contribute to making this community better? And I think what we want to really be able to say is that everybody has the opportunity to contribute no matter where you sit. And so I'm going to start with at least one question while I wait for the others. Um, and uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Beasley on this question and anybody else can add. So this question is coming from a parent. What are some ways that I can help to advance child well-being in this community? I think the, e the easiest way is to work with your school to volunteer support as we work on literacy. As you well know, literacy is a big, a big indicator of child well-being. And so working with, with schools, volunteering to provide students those additional opportunities. Of course, as a parent, taking full advantage of the resources that we are uh, providing to all of our students to really accelerate that literacy. But again, volunteering and supporting the work at the local school because that's where the rubber meets the road at the local school. That presence, the, the, the visibility of parents and volunteers at the school is so important to creating those literate cultures, positive cultures, healthy cultures, and then finding opportunities within the space of the school to assist with the literacy efforts. I think that will go a long way.
to advance the work that we're all collectively working on. Yeah, so you're speaking my language. I have a master's in education and literacy is by far, I think, a critical piece for our children as well. Uh, Dietrich, did you have anything to add and maybe about what? Well, just to kind of piggyback on Dr. Beasley, again, it's about um, getting involved, wherever that might be. And sometimes we think that the involvement doesn't have any impact, doesn't really mean anything. Oftentimes, yeah, well, let's call it what it is. Leadership don't have all the answers. We don't know all things. And so it's important that you get involved and provide context to the work. Um, what we're trying to do from a government perspective, and I can just speak for my, my cohorts on the city side, is that um, they have a lot of planning opportunities, whether you're talking about jo the Blueprint Jonesboro, you're talking about the marketing initiative in um, the city of Morrow, um, you're talking about you know, this huge development as it pertains to Forest Park. And so oftentimes the community collectively don't know about those opportunities to get better involved about what can they do to provide the optics that the cities and the county may need. So we ask that you just stay plugged into your county's website or your city's website to ensure that anything that's going on, you get involved and ask the pertinent questions. Uh, let me start with great question, it seems. Um, Representative Soval, you go, and then Shannon, and then we'll come down the line. Echoing um, the involvement of, of, of parents. Um, parents being involved in schools make a huge difference in the outcome of, uh, of their children, not only their children, but the other children in that particular classroom. Um, and also, uh, having a welcoming school climate makes a huge difference. Because although we say parents go and get involved, but if they first walk in that door, and there's not a welcoming uh, climate there, then they might turn around. Or sometimes parents might feel that the education level is not where it should be. They might not make the correct sentence, structure, and they're gonna be judged by that. So playing a you know, role of that um, good school climate, um, and then um, making their way into that classroom, and even if they can't come to the classroom, you might work for a company that's looking for, to partner with a school. Why not recommend your individual school as a partner with, um, with the company that you're working for? You don't have to physically be at the school in order to be a um, partnership. And the other part is, like I said earlier, is speaking up. If you see something that's not right, you have the ability and that right as a parent to speak up and see, say what it is. Sometimes you might not know something else is going on behind the scene. One of the other things when I talk about speaking up, the U.S. Department of Labor just made a ruling um, that allows parents to use their Family Medical Leave Act to be able to attend IEP meetings. Um, so now that used to be a barrier when you had students that had disabilities that the parents could not attend, but now uh, that door has been opened up. So those type of things, that information getting out, the parents now can advocate and say, no, I have a right, this is a necessity for me to be there because all, of that, all of those things work together. Absolutely. I, can't uh, I will piggyback <laughs> everyone's yeah. comment, uh, but I would only add, uh, you know, I, miss, I guess one of the strategies from one of my favorite authors, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, talks about the talented tenth, right? And the, the talented tenth reaching back to that 90% and pulling back up. And I know that, you know, we're, we're all advocates for our own children, right? I've got three kids, and of course I want them to be much greater than I am, right? I want to see them very successful. Uh, as less stress as possible, but they're giving me as much stress, I think, right now. But, uh, but I, I said all that to say, you know, I want us to be also cognizant of mentoring. Uh, you know, one way that you can improve that index is not only looking after your child, but thinking about getting engaged into a mentoring program. Uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters has a very huge initiative right now uh, that they're looking to recruit mentors. Uh, there are several programs uh, within Clayton County, 100 black men uh, are right here. We participated with them as an organization. Uh, so I would challenge uh, those in the audience and to not only take this conversation here, but outside of these walls, right? And, and really start thinking seriously about mentoring, reaching back, pulling someone else up, uh, another child, another student. Uh, that influence that you give uh, could really change someone's life, right? It's tithing in the universe. And, and I have no question, a, a, a reflection of it, exactly that. I'm a pouring in of several mentors uh, who put themselves basically into my life, uh, and now they have a, the return on their investment now, right? And, uh, and now I'm looking to do the same. Um, I agree with everybody's comment, um, but one of the things also is that for the businesses, that they um, get flexible work hours so that their employees can go and volunteer at schools. Because once you go into a school and you start volunteering and working with children, you have a better understanding uh, of what goes on in the school. 
And for parents, it is really important if they can come out and volunteer uh, in the school, because like they said, it also, they can go back and they can encourage other parents to come and volunteer. So it's a great segue to one of the questions, and that is um, the person who asked is, I have a small business with limited resources, but I really want to do more for the children and families in Clayton. What are some of the ways that I can get involved? I would love to hear some examples. The first thing is connect with the school near your business. It doesn't have to be a whole lot. Sometimes just building that relationship with the principal and being there at, at school-wide events having a presence, connecting with the PTA, et cetera. So first connect with that school right there, the closest school, figure out what, what's the closest school to the business and connect with that school. And, and one of the things, um, I was the community relations liaison for the school district. And one of the things that we really stressed was having reciprocal relationships. So everything is not about money. So by that individual being a small business, they don't have to give money to the school. There may be time or there may be some kind of resource that they can offer to the school. And we also off, always encourage the schools to offer resources back to those businesses. Any other examples? I was going to say, um, as a small business owner myself, as raising uh, my children, um, being very intricately involved in the school, and it's a win-win, actually, when you look at it both ends. Um, being able to be involved and offer those services. A lot of times, even now, with our students, when we talk about career pathways, a lot of them don't have an idea about what careers uh, are, except for the traditional ones. But there are so many new, non-traditional careers that where they didn't even exist five and 10 years ago. So just for that small business owner, being able to come into the school, not just doing the once a year of career, uh, career, career fair, uh, but being able to constantly, as, as the time permits, being able to share, how did they particularly get into that particular business? What was it that drove them to become an entrepreneur? Because as we move into the, um, to the future, more entrepreneurs are being developed all the time. And so being able to share that uh, with the students um, as well as their experience, and at the same time, a small business, that's free advertisement that you end up getting. That's why I say it's a win-win um, on both sides. So uh, I definitely uh, commend that particular person and encourage them and other small business owners to get involved, start with your child's school. That's where you want to be able to make the impact, like the superintendent said, and, um, and go from there. Yes, sir. I can take your call for a question. Bring one key point. Um, success of communities is really contingent upon the work that you do outside of the non-school hours. To really provide impact to the school system is what is the work that we're doing prior to the kids being in school? And so we have to figure out ways or what are the other avenues and other modes of communication that we probably hadn't, um, I guess, explored. Um, as it pertains to the question to be specific, um, I, I, people don't look at the chamber as being another mechanism by which you can provide information to. Now, we're not talking about your relationship with the chamber through your membership. We talk about your relationship with the chamber about what other events and activities are taking place in the community that you may be able to provide resources to to support programs like education, programs like what might be happening in your respective community. So I also would just encourage them to look at your, uh, our Chamber of Commerce as another mode and another avenue by which they can provide resources to, to help with um, our respective communities. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I have some more questions. Um, speaking about those non-school hours, um, this question is about how do we leverage our recreational centers, so those other community centers in the community to really impact both what they can do to support families um, as well as how they support the community and other um, services in the community. <laughs> uh, seriously though, um, one of the things we're trying to do in our parks and recreation facilities, we have right now six in our inventory and we're building additional facilities. Um, we're looking at building a facility, an intergenerational facility off of Flint River Road. There is a, um, the District 4 Recreation Center that will be built at International Park. So there are new facilities that are coming on board as we speak. Um, I would just, I would encourage our citizens to look at our facilities in a non-traditional way. We get that athletics plays a role. We know that there's opportunities for Tai Chi and we have our aquatic facilities. Um, but recreation centers can be a hub for life skill development as a whole. So we're now trying to ensure that some of the amenities in our facilities have training kitchens, you know, if a kid has an opportunity to look at culinary arts as a pathway, then they shouldn't just have to look at it in the schools. They should be able to look at opportunities in the recreation centers to do things of that sort. 
So we're trying to figure out ways to do our non-traditional means of providing the service. The other part of that is that partnering with our nonprofits. We don't profess to know all things when it comes to providing service in that space. So now we're trying to get other municipalities or we're trying to get other um, nonprofit organizations to play a role to maximize that space. You know, we have this opportunity with um, the work labs throughout the country where you have this um, incubator and you learn more about the development in that. Well, why not use your government space in that same capacity? And so we're trying to figure out ways to look at partners that bring another strength to our community because there's a need and it's not that government, government needs to provide the service all the time. You can use that space to build out those respective programs that you would like to see. Okay. One thing we're working on is developing some collaborations between the school system and parks and recreation so we can use those spaces beyond the school day and dur throughout the summertime to really allow students, of course, to have fun, but to learn. And so we're looking at some STEM activities, some kinesiology activities, et cetera, within those spaces. And we're hopeful that within the, uh, by next summer, we'll, we'll be bringing some programs online. Awesome. I was going to say that um, it goes back to what I talked about earlier about policies. So policies have to be flexible enough where the county commission, like Deidre said, is moving towards that to be able to allow where it's before it was so stringent and streamlined. Same thing with our um, with the school board being able to open up the policy that hey we know that this partnership has to take place. What are the policies that are impeding us as a community that we need to look at that we never even thought about um, before? And then even on the state level, there might be some policies that we didn't even know about that might hinder this entity from uh, working with this particular entity and even working with the private um, private sector. So policies still play a huge role and that's still where the community comes in and say, hey, we want to see this happen. What needs to be done? The bottom line is what needs to be done, what needs to be changed in order for these things to happen, which goes back to policy. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about policy and advocacy because this next question is about, you know, this work takes both the direct services, we need to enhance the services that families need. We also need to make sure that we organize residents and communities to be actively engaged. And the third part of the wheel, I think, to us is also, what are those, that policy and advocacy space? Like, what does that have to look like? So this question is, um, how can advocacy organizations um, really support the school system and other partners and really having the greatest impact for this community. So what things can organizations who are really focused on advocacy, housing advocacy, educational advocacy, and all those, all those kinds of issues help to support this work as well? I think that the best thing is to get piped into what's going on because we have several um, initiatives, whether it's homelessness or whether it's literacy, uh, parks and recreations using those opportunities get piped in to what's going on and use your voice to help us get that work done if there are uh, policy issues to help us navigate beyond the policies sometimes it's just having people at the table who understand what the policy is why it is a policy and helping us to figure out exactly what do we need to do to change that policy or what's the best way to change the policy so get piped in into what's really occurring within the, within the school system. And I'll say within the county, because we're all, honestly, we're all working together. And so get piped in, whether it be through your state officials, the county government, the school system, the Aerotropolis, just get piped into what's really going on. Okay, I'd like to add to that, um, because advocacy organization exists, uh, the reason why policies change. And because they're on the front line, they know more than what we know on the back end. So my recommendation is definitely educating the policymakers and those that are in those positions about what's really going on when it comes to housing. How is that affecting the homeless population? Why do we have people living in the, in the trees um, in, in other areas that they should not be, that we don't see every day, but because those advocacy groups are out there, they know a lot more that's going on as to us than what we know. So their responsibility is to make sure and continue to, I'm not saying they have to continue, to make sure that we understand what's going on on the, on the front line and how it affects overall the things that we're looking at uh, for policy. So continue on what they're doing and help uh, educate us and educate the community because a lot of times the community don't know that we have a homeless um, issue down here in Clayton because they don't 
physically see it, but if those advocacy groups are going in, making sure the people are fed, they're going and making sure they have health um, care needs um, met, but the average citizen might not know that, and so they don't know to advocate for those particular uh, issues that are going on. Not at the table, uh, you're on the menu, right? And I think some great examples that I can speak directly of, I think I've become a uh, champion of any Casey Foundation, but they are an advocacy group or a foundation that is very uh, holistic in their view around what economic inclusion looks like, right? Uh, from a top-down, bottom-up approach. And so, you know, they've been very intentional in partnering with, with us and several other organizations throughout the Metro Atlanta region on making sure uh, that the conversation is not is not left off, right? That we're we're constantly thinking about you know inclusive practices uh, that benefit all. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. And so for us uh, as an organization, uh, we've obvious, we're obviously uh, you know focused on growth and development, uh, but also making sure that growth is inclusive. And because of advocacy advocacy groups like Annie e. Casey Foundation, uh, they continue to educate us, right, and help us understand the data that persists uh, and what's happening in the ecosystem uh, to make sure that we're, we're very focused on um, our efforts but being more intentional that uh, while we're doing these efforts, we're thinking about, you know, talent pipelines and local hiring and, you know, what community benefits agreements look like and how do we rally uh, the community to, to, to be collective uh, and what they want. Uh, and so, you know, those advocacy, group, advocacy groups are, are very important to all of our initiatives. And without them, right, educating us and at the table, um, you know, that's how those uh, efforts are being led because of their voices. So I would say, get at the table. Absolutely. So I have another question. A couple of these questions um, are specific about issues in the community and, and really what you all think about in terms of how do we address solutions to support them. So one of them is about mental health and really supporting children and families, right? So we talk a lot about the trauma that families experience by some of the things you just described, by having to move multiple times, by having to change schools multiple times, by having to think about where food is gonna come from to put on that table, right? And so it's not just a clinical perspective, but also the trauma that our communities and the communities that we see across Clayton County and in these low and very low child mean zip codes are experiencing. I wonder if you all would talk a little bit about kind of your perspective about what those strategies and solutions are thinking about, how to support the mental health of our families to really be able to see that they can thrive with all of the supports and services, but that they will be able to thrive for the long term. Well, I'll start out as a school system. The first thing we've done is we've, we've developed our health wellness model to ensure that we, we connect our partners who can assist us with these challenges. So within the local school, we have developed our circles of support. So the adults are meeting, figuring out who needs the support, and then we're bringing the partners in to help our students, our families, get the help that they need. And so whenever I get a, a, a communication, someone wants to support this work, we pipe them into our model. And it's a very structured model, but it, it gives all of the various service providers in the community that really want to help with this work an opportunity to support our schools and families, our students and their families. And I have to emphasize in their families, because oftentimes in order to really help the child, you have to help the entire family. So that's one way. But again, then you have many schools are developing their own partnerships to ensure that the students are getting the help that they need. The families are getting the support that they need. So of course we have a, a systemic or district-led uh, approach that impacts every school, but our principals and our counselors, they're, they're very resourceful. And so they're connecting with partners and connecting families. Our PTA is very critical to connecting families with the resources. Oftentimes, if you don't know that there's an issue, it's very difficult to, to offer resources. So we're, we're closing that gap, being very clear. Here's an opportunity, and if we can connect that business or that service provider to that opportunity, that's what we're working to do. But ensuring that we're working together to 
look at the data so we can see it improve, whether it be our families who are staying in extended stays, what can we do? Our homeless department, led by Ms. Sonia Davis, phenomenal in the support that they provide to our families that are considered homeless or dealing with an episode of homelessness. All of those systems are very supportive to addressing the mental health, mental wellness of our students and, I have to say, our families. Um, I was going to say, uh, working with organizations like Clayton Center, um, which is partnered with, uh, with the school system that handles uh, mental health for the, for the county, and, um, and, and give, being able to give support that they need on the resources, you know, from the county level, from the city level, and even the support that they're getting uh, from the state level. Because mental health is a serious, uh, serious issue. You know, if you're not feeling your best, it affects the workforce, the workforce area of the kids. Uh, if you're not feeling your best, it's for showing love and appreciation for your kid. It affects that, that child going to school angry, and the teachers and everybody trying to figure out what's going on, something has changed. So mental health is a, a real issue. And, uh, and as a state, I can't say that we have made more of a focus on it and putting the money where it needs to be or should be starting off uh, with the APEX program um, that each one of the school districts will receive additional, help, receive additional money to be able to focus on those social uh, and emotional um, things that are going on with our young people. And so I think as a community, if we're advocating for ment more mental health services, it's advocating to those elected officials that we are making those policies. And the most important part of all the policy stuff that I talked about is voting. If the people are not voting and electing people in those positions that are going to look out for the well-being of the people, all this what we're talking about is not going to make a difference because you have to have people that are close down to the line and know what's going on. So, you know, if you're not registered to vote, you need to get registered because that's how our United States is based and made and built on is voting and having a, having a voice through your elected body. Did you want to add? Uh, I think the other part that we recognize from a government service side is engagement. So I always talk about the public safety sector. If you engage in someone with a mental illness in the community, oftentimes the only resolution is taking them to jail, right? And so therefore that becomes another statistic, that becomes something else that's become reflective of the community, and that may not be the best avenue for which to address the mental illness. So we're working with the Clayton Center and working with some of our other thought partners around how do we address that if a police officer comes in contact with someone that clearly they understand the signs, they understand the symptoms of dealing with someone that has a, a mental illness, then are there some other alternatives that we can bring into play to ensure that we provide the, the requisite services? Um, on top of that, um, there's this, again, this issue with, about resources. Um, clearly, in the space of dealing with mental, mental illness, um, whether you're talking about state providing resources or the county as a whole, there's never enough. So you have to figure out how do you now have this consolidation of services. Unfortunately, we've had this perspective about this siloed approach to the work again, that we have to have our own building and you've got to have your own resources. Well, think about a recreation center. If you're being innovative, if there's opportunity to have mental illness training and classes to have the general community to understand what the symptoms are so they can recognize it. So when they're calling 911, they can provide context to what the issue is, opposed to saying there's somebody running down the street and they got a problem. Then that kind of sets the context of how you deal with it. So we just got to be, again, we have to be innovative in that space to figure out how do we maximize our resources that we already have, opposed to feeling like we got to build something new and allocate new resources when we already know we don't have enough dollars to do it. Absolutely. I love that because I think some of that is about changing the frame around mental health to thinking about hope, healing, and care, right? How do we really provide that hope, healing, and care for our communities, which might be in the community, it's not about a building, it's not about any one provider, but how do we do that differently, right? Um, so I'm gonna turn to you, Shannon, because this question is to add a little bit more around workforce development, and so, um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what's the work that's happening or needs to happen for young people, particularly young people who might not be in school or in working. We have a really critical challenge in our region also about the number of increasing number of young people who are not connected to school systems, um, who are not connected to communities or nonprofits or rec centers. And so have you all given some thought or some strategies around how you all are thinking about that population of young people in this region, in this community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a really 
really good question. Uh, to be quite honest, that's one of Clinton's focus, no question about it, that, that segment, to be quite honest. Uh, Goody Mob, uh, for those of you who may not or may be familiar with that group, uh, has a saying in one of their verses about uh, unequal economics can easily make you some enemies, right? And so when you've got that segment that is basically somewhat out of the labor force, uh, then they are looking for how can they basically live their lifestyle, right? And they typically resort to, uh, you know, activities that we wouldn't all be uh, promoting our fans of. And so how do we now take that segment, right, that, that 18 to 24, 26, uh, and back into the labor force and more productive uh, in society versus uh, becoming more of a challenge. And so what we've done is, is made a very focused effort with Clinton Covington, uh, with WorkSource Aerotropolis, uh, from that job seeker uh, focus segment is that, that 18 to 26 to 30 segment. And those are the individuals that we're speaking of. And so how do we capture uh, that audience? How do we now turn that into uh, productivity uh, for our region, which ultimately uh, now creates stability in a household? Uh, it creates, uh, it helps the mental challenges in families. Uh, it creates a sense of now pride and, and now can provide, if you will. And so uh, we're very focused on that. Uh, as we continue to grow as an organization, I could totally see it become even more of a focus, almost a committee or collective, an initiative, if you will. Uh, but for right now, what we've done is uh, identified the challenge. Uh, we've worked with our partners across the region. We've created a work source Aerotropolis individual who is focused uh, on that very topic. Um, so this question is a little, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think uh, having more of a, of, of a focus, even like what uh, Shannon said, even with apprenticeship programs, um, that are paid apprenticeship programs, and where the students can be able to see I'm getting paid while I'm going through the training, at the end of, of my commitment, I'm gonna have a, a, a certification that allow me to be able to go anywhere to be able to utilize uh, my skills, and especially the uh, focus of apprenticeship in those uh, areas where we don't have enough workforce in, I can't stress that enough, because then that way they're not competing in other areas where we are oversaturated uh, when it um, comes to that. And also utilizing our small business development centers. So a lot of times with our young people, they might get in some trouble, but they really have some talents when it comes down to selling, marketing, and producing some of the things they might not should be producing. But how do you redirect um, those skills um, by utilizing things that we already have in place, like creating that entrepreneurship and showing this the right way to go. So you don't have to be looking over your back and seeing, you know, if you're going to be arrested. But these are the things, the opportunities that we have as a free marketplace here in um, in Georgia, in the United States. That a lot of times they don't even know that that's a, a whole pathway that they could go through. That they might have dropped out of school and said, "Hey, you can get back on track." Because at the end of the day, it's important for us that we have productive citizens in our community. That is how our community is gonna grow. That's how the tax base money is gonna come in to be able to support all the things that we're talking about, resources, still comes back to money. You can have income, but you got to have the money part to go to it. And how do you do that? How do you keep from the taxes being raised on our citizens? More businesses coming into the community, and even whether it's entrepreneurship or through commercial, the larger companies that are coming into the uh, area. So having those types of, uh, of focuses like that. And I can tell you many people in the audience, I bet you don't even know we have WorkSource Clayton that's located behind Costco's on Mount Zion. That's a part of the Atlanta Regional and what um, Shannon was talking about. So going back to getting that information out for they can, so they can utilize it. Because what happens in our community in Clayton, if you don't utilize the resources, then when allocation comes to redirect it, we're going to close that center down. We're going to close that. We're going to close that. And then at the end, it's our um, citizens who suffer. Yeah, and I think this, this opportunity for young people who are not in school and not working is huge because the economic potential of those young people in the workforce and their ability to really be able to be the future of this community is so critical to not just one partner. Again, it's one of those examples where a number of systems and partners have to work together because they're not connected to any one system. So I think a great example. And I, I do myself a disservice if I didn't recognize our workforce development collective. Uh, we have an actual collective that's dedicated where you've got 
experts across the region, uh, specifically Clayton, uh, who are part of that initiative, and having these conversations, and how do we now uh, create a uh, collective strategy to help you know, solve that problem? And I just want to add, and, and Dr. Beasley mentioned it, how do you get ahead of that problem, right? How do you become more proactive in those efforts? And so our education collective uh, is, is a big part of the initiative is career pathways. And so we're extremely excited about in October the 18th hosting a career expo uh, at the Georgia International Convention Center in partnership with Clayton County Public Schools and Fulton County Public Schools to now expose them to these opportunities well before they exit uh, the school system and, and into the, the real world. And so how do we get ahead of that? And so we're working towards that. So we are winding down time, but before we do that, um, I wanted to um, have each of you have an opportunity to really be able to give kind of your last words, right? And for me, the question is, um, what is your vision for this community? What do you, if we are successful in, what, in all the work we're talking about, right? We think that this child will be a movement, one, it's not just us at United Way, that it takes time, that we have a goal to really be able to work with communities differently. But our vision is that all those children are well, right? That we are doing something dramatically different than what we're doing today. And I wonder if each of you will, would just leave us with, what is your vision? Like, what is your hope for the children and families in this particular community here? Does anybody want to start first? Well, I'll, just, I'll just share. I, I want our kids to have opportunities. Opportunities within the K-12 space and well beyond the K-12 space. And that requires that they're critical thinkers, they're literate, that we, the adults, ensure that they know what these opportunities are that information and, and opportunities are provided to them. They, we want them to have opportunities, um, ones that exist today and possibly ones that don't exist today. There's a quote that, uh, that I kind of live by and, and it kind of goes, at the beginning of the day is all about the possibilities, at the end of the day is all about the results. And so what we struggle with oftentimes, we talk about vision is what's happening in between. We know what we strive for, and we know what it should look like when it's all said and done. And so my vision and my goal as it pertains to my workspace as supporting the goals and objectives of the Board of Commissioners is to ensure that we can understand that space in between. I get that at the end of the day, as citizens, there's these possibilities they like the community to be and what they want it to look like. And that we all got a sense of really what we want it to be when it's all said and done. I think the struggle oftentimes is to work in between. And so again, part of our discussion today is about a call to action. It's ensuring that folk understand that they all, we all play a role in getting us to that result. And so my vision is that ultimately we continue to develop these nodes, communication methods, opportunities so that people understand that I am engaged and I, my voice is being heard. And then ultimately we can continue to kind of manifest that work around that space. I can go. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, being that we are, uh, our child well-being index score is the lowest in the 13 count. That's the realistic part of it. And, uh, and being that this is important for us to be having this open conversation that we realize there's a problem. But how do you move from being a problem and continue? Like, we have improved it over the two years. But we as a community in Clayton County are going to have to work harder. We're going to have to work harder than any other, other um, 13 county, other 12 counties. And so envisioning a community that is so sick and tired of being sick and tired that they start moving towards uh, pressure, uh, applying that pressure to policymakers and saying, what are you going to do? And at the same time, while they're asking us, what are you going to do? What are they willing to step up and do as well? So they can't just complain, but they got to help offer solutions um, to it so that we can have a better community um, for, the, uh, for the future. So the last part is get involved. Get involved. If you feel like you're not getting invited to the table, you make your own invitation to come sit at the table. That's the only way things are going to change here in Clayton County is our citizens start becoming involved and get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Absolutely. Because our organization has a, no question, a regional focus, uh, the vision, uh, at least in my mind, would be uh, you know, that there's true connectivity uh, from a transportation standpoint that exists uh, within Clayton uh, and obviously within South Fulton, but in our region. 
so connectivity is important. You know, transportation uh, really opens the door. And so a connected community uh, that is thriving uh, with various assets of portfolios, not just a heavy concentration in one segment, whether it's logistics or, or an industrial component, but you know, mixed use com communities with retail and, and, and housing that's affordable uh, with mixed communities, not just one set of communities, uh, and more diversity. Uh, you know, Diedrich mentioned uh, the, the, ch the shift in demographics for the county. So how do we now continue to create the ecosystem of growth, but also uh, inclusive, inclusivity, but it's also diverse uh, in ethnic makeup. I think the city of Mauro is one of the most diverse uh, cities in the county. So how do we now uh, allow that to grow and expand without the entire county? And it's more inviting for international communities uh, to decide to locate right here in Clayton County for uh, jobs uh, to live, work, and play. So, you know, an all-inclusive, growing, prosperous area that has communities that, that aren't pushing out families, but being inclusive, uh, that is well connected. Uh, if once we get to that point, which will take some time, right? Uh, that, that is the ultimate vision. Um, for me, um, I envision um, that we would have pride in the place that we live at. And um, a lot of times uh, the residents will say, well, the news media is not being very nice to us. Well, that's not their job. And that we take pride, and then that pride is also in our schools, that we become actively engaged um, in the children in our community, that we support them, that we go to sporting events, that we go to the performing arts when they have plays, that we go in the schools and we engage and we talk to them. If we see them in the grocery store, we talk to them about what they're doing. And we encourage them um, so that they will see that they can be successful and that their community is behind them. I think one of the greatest ways for our kids to be, to be successful is that they know that they are from a loving community that really does believe in them and wants them to be successful. And I think that if we do that, then our children will be successful. Well, I thank you all. I think this was a great conversation about both, obviously, the challenges, but the opportunities um, and the hope that we envision for the children and families um, here in our community. Um, for us at United Way, this is about absolutely what you just talked about, all of those ways in which we address those um, challenges for families around. We didn't get to food insecurity, but thinking about how we support families and how they you know, have the food that they need, how we make sure we ensure that there's housing stability, how we make sure they have all the strong educational supports, how we create a table for all so nobody is left out, how do we make sure that we have the economic self-sufficiency work, the workforce development, not just for the highest achieving, but for those folks who are not connected to systems, who need those opportunities. Um, and again, it is all of us. It is not just the folks at this table, it's everybody in the community and those who are not here. Um, and I want to just leave us with a quote um, that reminds me, and I think you all embody it exactly, um, and that Marion Wright Edelman, um, who is a advocate for children, and particularly those children who need us the most, um, says about her work that I truly believe in, that service is the rent we pay for being. It's the very purpose of our life, not something you do in your spare time, right? And so, obviously, we all have dedicated our lives to this work, but it's our purpose. And I encourage all of you all to think about how you use your purpose, your passion, and your position, wherever you are, whether you are a parent in the local schools, whether you are a resident living in a community, whether you lead a nonprofit, whether you work as a non and work at a nonprofit, how do you contribute to the changes in this community? And remind us that where would we be without those everyday average leaders who led social movements of our time? Ella Baker was a leader who worked behind the scenes, right? She didn't want to be on the front spotlight. So how do we also ensure that all of us are really able to work together to be able to move the needle for this community and support the young people? So again, I encourage us to think about Rachel. Rachel, it was really intentional for us to have a young person up here um, because this work is through the eyes of children and young people and without their voices at the table, we can't get this work done. Um, so lastly, 
I want to leave us with um, some things, some things for us to do. So the Child Wellbeing Index is what kind of stirred this a little bit. There was work that was happening and it catalyzed us. Um, but if you want to know more about how the score was developed, what it looks like, what we encourage you to do is go to our website. Um, Jenna Baugh is in the room somewhere. And so if you have more questions about what makes up that score, what that looks like, please be able to talk to her, any of United Way staff. But go on our website, unitedwayatlanta.org. Search the map, look at the score. You can actually look at it by zip code, by a census tract, by other communities. Become a champion for child well-being. We've already talked about the various ways in which you can get involved. Use the data to help others connect the dots. The reality is, is unfortunately, the sad truth is that this region, this particular county has a very low score, and we want that to be different. When we sit back at this table, again, we want to be able to see a very, tell a very different story, but it's going to take all of us. Um, be able to really leverage, again, your profession, your purpose and passion. Everyone in this room has a role in this child well-being movement, and we are excited about the journey together, excited about the progress, and really wanting all of us to join in with the movement. So share with a friend, take a look at those maps, leverage your network so that we can really make a difference in this community. Thank you, and thank you to all of the panelists. We really appreciated your time, and to the team and talent who put all of this together. And I think Dr. Beasley is gonna close us out just to remind us again and center us for where we are and the work we have ahead. Yeah, and I'll just say as we prepare to, to end, everybody just get engaged um, and, and stay unified on the children. You know, sometimes as adults, we, you know, we all have our little egos and our various agendas. But I can assure you that in order to move this, this data, this county, it's going to take unity. And I'm just of the belief that God doesn't bless anything but unity. And we need his blessing. So we got to be unified and focused on our children. Whether you believe that or not, communities, high-performing communities that are making progress for their children, they're unified. They have differences. But you got to be unified. You got to stay focused on children. And you got to make sure that all of your processes, your policies, your strategies, they are children focused, family focused, community focused to lift up the entire community. Not as uh, Shannon described, not extractive policies where you take the resources and designate them for just a few people, but inclusive practices where you're focused on lifting up the entire community the entire community, and that's what this is all about. So our data is improving, our child well-being is improving, but we've got work to do, Clayton County, don't we? Don't we? Yes, we do. Can we get the work done? And we should, why? Because our children are counting on us. And I always say this, all of us enter the stage and we all exit the stage at some point. All of us enter and exit. When we enter, we enter to work. When we exit, we should leave this county, this community, better than it was when we entered. And if we've not done that, then we didn't fulfill the purpose that allowed us to enter the stage. Fulfill our purpose while we're here in whatever capacity, position, role that you have. Fulfill your purpose and remember our purpose, this generation's purpose, is to make it better for the next generation. And if we forget that, then we have forgotten our purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.